Welcome to our last Reggae University session at the 25th edition of Rotterdam Sunsplash called Production Something, the current state of the reggae music industry. Please give a very well, warm welcome to our guests, which are Patricia Meschino and also Sonia Stanley Nyer, Jerome Hamilton and Gussie Clark. And I'm going to introduce them, all of them with a few sentences shortly. And also on the panel is London-based David Katz, author of the Lee Perry biography, People Funny Boy, and also Solid Foundation, an oral history of reggae. Unfortunately, as some people might know, Piatosi had to leave the festival because of a family emergency. My name is Ellen Curlings, and next to me is Pete Lilly, and we are both editors of Rhythm Magazine based in Cologne, Germany. And yeah, I want to give you a few sentences to each guest that you know who is taking part in this session. Um, I start with Patricia Meschino. It was via a common friend that Pete and me got introduced to Patricia Meschino. She was co-editor when we published Rhythm Magazine in English. Pat, I really hope that we can revive the English version. Mm. And Thank Pat you. has been writing on reggae, dancehall, and Jamaican culture since 1991. She started her writing career with Reggae Report, a monthly Miami-based magazine. She had a long association with Sky Writings and worked with BobMarley.com. For quite a while now, she writes for the famous Billboard magazine. Give her again another applause. The other woman on the panel is Sonia Stanley Naya, head of the Institute of Caribbean Studies at the University of the West Indies in Mona Kingston. She has been teaching and researching Caribbean cultural studies, ritual dance music for many years, and is the author of Dance Hall from Slave Ship to Ghetto. Furthermore, she is a leading author on Jamaican popular culture and has published many articles in various journals. Welcome, Sonia Stanley Naya, to the Reggae University. And next to Sonia, it's Jerome Hamilton. First time Pete and me met Jerome Hamilton was at Reggae Sunsplash in 1998. I still have the business card you gave me, Jerome. In a fast-changing business like Jamaican music, it is something very precious to successfully operate a broad-based company like Headline Entertainment, whose services includes promotion and publicity, event planning and coordination, international and local entertainment bookings, as well as general entertainment consultancy. Alone the artist roster that seems to include every important Jamaican artist ranging from Sean Paul, Stephen and Damien Marley to Chronic's protege to Shensea, just to name a few, shows the standing of the company. Welcome the very humble head of Headline Entertainment, Jerome Hamilton. And yes, now I want to introduce a famous record producer, Gussie Clark. Our former editor used to operate a vinyl reggae record store in Cologne, Germany, called Music Works, <laughs> as a homage to the work of the legendary Jamaican producer, Augustus Gussie Clark, who produced exceptional work with DJs like Uroy, Big Use, and Iroy, with greats like Gregory Isaacs, Augustus Augustus Pablo, Dennis Brown, just to name a few. In the late 1980s, his dancehall productions stood out because of their crossover potential. In 1988, he established his music work studio and ruled the upcoming dancehall era with his productions. Gussie Clark is a perfectionist professional who has always gathered the best songwriters, musicians, engineers, and mixers to create superb recordings. He doesn't get stuck in the past, but loves to look into the future. Welcome, Gussie Clark, to the Reggae University. And um, yeah, I want 
to ask Gussy the first question. You know, apart from Bob Marley and a handful of other artists, Jamaican music has always been produced and sold independently from major record companies. And Gussy, you were very successful with your productions in the 1980s and early 90s especially because you had gathered a professional team around you to create hits like Gregory Isaac's Rumors, Gregory Isaac's Rumors, Telephone Love by J.C. Lodge, Pirate's Anthem by Home T, Coco T and Shabarangs, as well as Shabarangs and Crystal's Twice My Age, just to name very few. Can you maybe take us back to that time and uh, tell us how you managed to reach an international audience? Well, there was not an intent to reach an international audience. There was just an intent to just make music a little bit different, a certain way, and a little bit more cutting edge than the norm which was being done. So we basically took a very different approach, a much more business approach, combined with a creative approach, and at the end of the day, it ended up being very unique. Many of the songs that um, you have called, some of the artists weren't even aware of the songs until we call them in and ask them would they like to participate in the project. So the songs were actually written before, demos were made of the songs, and then we figured that when they hear something that seemed like to be successful, then there would be no question about do I want to be a part of it. So it's kind of like, you know, you're cooking a meal and you seize up everything before and then you just basically put the final touch. That's how we did. It was not like they came in and wrote songs. We had a team, a great team, persons who did vocal supervision, you know, persons who did some arrangement, persons who wrote the songs. We had, you know, a new generation of engineers and a new generation and sound of equipment. So with all of that together, we ended up with something being unique, okay. and it worked. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, when I think of it, I, now they have all these camps, you know, around big pop stars like Rihanna and stuff, you know, but it's actually the way you, you did it from very early to have this team spirit around your productions. And um, Jerome, Headline entertainment exists for yeah over two decades now, right? So maybe you can take us back a little bit at the beginning, you know, how you started it and what does it take, you know, to operate a company successfully? I want to thank you and Ratitam for having me here. Yes, headline started um, 1996. Uh, uh, with the idea that our music had grown quite a bit. I had the experience of working with Reggae Sunsplash, which is the great experience I've ever had in reggae music. And it set the tone for um, somebody with university background to go into a business which is traditional and not like that. Um, I, I think we saw the need for a booking agent. Uh, um, we wanted to be two things, booking agents, and we wanted to be publicists. One, we didn't think Jamaica had enough booking agents, and we are one of very few booking agents that are not managers, because we manage no act. And we also proudly say we started the business of entertainment publicity because we thought it should be a business. And in fact, I thought I would have made more money doing that than being a booking agent. I was wrong, you know? But it, we, we thought Jamaica had needed an agency that believed that we could build a brand with what existed before. My, my experience in university was, it was not something for people to strive to be one, to be part of the music industry if you went to university, and very few people have followed in that way. But we think what has happened, the brand has grown, and Sean Paul's success was very important to us. And it, it's, it's a big effect on the world that a lot of people in reggae music don't realize. But there are two major effects for us that stand out. The Sean Paul effect and for dancehall, the Diwali effect. Those two made a big change in, in what bookings was available to a lot of artists. Africa opened after that when we traditionally had Europe and North America to a certain extent. But dancehall was not very successful in Dan North America. Uh, the Sean Paul's success with Dancehall opened markets. Wayne Wonder came in after that. Um, T.O.K. came in after that. And all of a sudden, in 10 years, Africa moved from no reggae concerts to over 20-odd countries. 
having traditional reggae artists. And it has spread now that we see the same thing impacting in, in Asia and Australia. And, and I think that, ha that has been good. One of the downsides for me, honestly, is, is that the Jamaican music brand has not grown. We are, as a company, let us say ourselves and Solid are exception. The Jamaican music brand as a business has not grown. The Jamaican brand has grown as talent. Yes, there is certain talent coming out of Jamaica, but we have not had enough people behind the talent to say here are strong enough people. And that is where I think our brand has suffered in bookings, in management, and other areas that we've never had that. Sure, sure. yeah. Sorry, but yeah. Um, Jerome, can you just uh, say a little bit about why you think the brand has not grown exactly? Why would that, what has held it back in terms of the music? In terms of, um, as somebody who lives, works, and practices in Jamaica as a booking agent, you know, Gussie is a producer, and and, and Son is an excellent writer. So I'm on a different side of the business, and 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 I do work with management. I think, firstly, it's not regarded as an industry by someone who aspires to get a tertiary education. When I came into the music business, I was at university studying math and economics. You know, I just had a love for it. Now there, there are certain courses, but it, the focus is, is going to be on event management. I think that is more what our courses teach. So there's not that interest there. Uh, there's a general feeling that as much as Jamaican music is very popular in Jamaica, it's still kind of murky industry. It's somewhere it's a bit shady. We want to avoid the tax people. We, we want to stay off the radar. Uh, so that happens. I, I think there are not enough successful examples to strive to. So somebody comes up in dance hall would see the success, and I'm not taking away from anybody's, and I'm going to suffer wrath when I say certain things. But when you see a successful artist coming up without a manager, and in your view, he has come from a humble background and achieved many things, you, why do you need a manager? You know, mm -hmm. uh, and there are great examples. Sean Paul's success is interesting. When Sean was, had two people on the road, he had a manager different from a booking agent, different from a publicist, different from a road manager. And I remember somebody laughed at us once and said, you guys are way too big for your size. You know? okay. And five days later, he had 26 people on the road. You know? But the fact that he started and he believed in a structure, he's one of four artists I know that his manager is not a booking agent. And it was from early, we're gonna do it separate. We're gonna do it, we follow a model that we see outside. And we don't think enough people look at that and not enough people call it copy the real success stories because they're not flashy enough. That's my view. Thank you. So, Michael, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I also want to include uh, Pat. Uh, Pat, you know, so what is your experience as being a reggae journalist? Because you started out to work mostly with independent publications, and now Billboard magazine is more like a mainstream publication, I would consider it. So maybe you tell us a little bit, you know, what it's like to get reggae journalism into the mainstream. Well, again, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this panel today. Um, my first time in Spain, my first time at Rotatom, and it's been a wonderful experience so far. And I know that will continue. Um, the journey, my journey as a journalist, yes, it started um, with Reggae Report magazine, uh, published by Miss Peggy Quattro in Miami, Florida, for many years. And um, that was the time, a very interesting time for the music. That was the time of major label input and support for reggae on a scale that we had never seen before and have not really seen since. That was the ascent of Shabba Ranks, Supercat, uh, Tony Rebel, Tiger, so many artists who were signed primarily to Sony Records, be it uh, Columbia or Epic were their major imprints who were signing so many artists and other labels followed suit. Atlantic Records had Garnet Silk for a while, and um, I know the Wailing Souls had a deal. There were just so many artists, so many deals. What those deals were really structured like, <laughs> that's a whole other issue, and it, I think it gets back to part of Jerome's point that, um, yes, people were getting deals, but what did the deals really mean, and how much money was being stolen from the artists? Like, all legally because that's what they signed to, but with proper guidance, that whole experience probably would have been 
a better chapter in the music's history than what I feel it ultimately turned out to be. Yes, it helped artists really ascend to the forefront. It helped uh, dancehall reggae in particular. I know the topic came up the other day about dancehall being so much of, in the fabric of popular music uh, with artists like Rihanna and Justin Bieber, you name it, Drake, borrowing, but oftentimes not identifying where this music comes from. Maybe that's not their job. I think that's beholden on us as the journalists, as other practitioners within the business to kind of make that point. So we drive that home that, in fact, that's, we're all gathered here today as a result of Jamaica. And, you know, I just don't think that can be repeated enough. It's like every stage is a debt to Jamaican music that the promoters you know, beautifully pay tribute to, and it's a joy for me to see that. But um, in terms of the journalism, um, you know, it's been, my own career, it's been a slow and steady, I guess, climb. Um, but the, the independent publications were great because they were so embraced, embracing of it, obviously, that's what they did. And um, at the time, with the major label infusion of cash or just marketing, I would say, more than actual cash to, real, to really support artists. Um, it helped provide visibility and outlets and paved the way for, again, what we're seeing now. And I started up with Billboard around nine, about 2005, 2006, that it became a regular gig. And it's been, you know, it's been great over the past few years, but even within my early years, you would have one editor would be there who would totally get the importance of what you're doing. Because mind you, these are not artists who would regularly, if at all, appear on the billboard charts. So some would say, yes, this is great. This is important music to write about. Even if it's not charting, we want this. A next editor would come in and say, I don't know who these people are. I don't want you writing about this. It's just not important to me. But I think over the years of having a presence in the magazine for, I mean, it's over a decade now, they see, and of course, online changed a lot of things. Um, I, where my own career is concerned for the better because it has allowed more space. There's infinite space online as opposed to pages in a magazine, but it's also they're able to track, you know, how many hits a story gets. And if you have a story about um, chronics, I know we did like the first story on chronics in a US mainstream publication. And when they see there's a great reaction, yeah, the editors may have never heard of this artist until you pitch them, but when they see there's people all over the world clicking on this story, then, you know, it encourages to do more artists, and maybe it wouldn't even be of a chronics level, but someone that you believe in, and you believe in their music, and you believe, you know, what they're doing is valid, or they just know that there's so many people deserving of exposure. It just allows for, you know, paves the way and allows that to have a place in the mainstream. So whether the music is playing on radio or not, whether the artists are seen on TV or not, I think Billboard has been extremely, in these recent years, extremely accommodating and very open to the music in all its forms, whether the artist is charting, whether they're just beginning, whether they are a veteran who hasn't gotten their due. And I'm just really happy to have played a small part in helping establish that there. Okay. Thank you. Um, Sondra, um, as, as um, the, the Reggae Studies Unit is part of the Institute of Caribbean Studies that you are the head of, maybe you can explain to us the role that the university plays to support the, the Jamaican music industry. Yeah, thank you so much for having me again on one of these reggae university panels. You know, this is my favorite reggae festival in the world, and it's really good to be back. Yeah, Pete, you know, I was sitting here thinking as all of our um, the fellow panelists spoke about how at the university we do not pause to actually reflect on the successes that we have had. You know, as a university, we, we beat up ourselves. We beat up ourselves when we look at the society because as educators, our role is to interpret the social reality, the social and cultural reality, and to actually provide solutions where there are challenges in a society. 
And so the Reggae Studies Unit is representative of one of those solutions. We grew up in a context where Jamaica did not have a critical mass of people interested in reggae. Reggae is Dutty Rasta, Bugo Yaga music, right? And to become a reggae artist in Jamaica at one point, I mean, perhaps there are sentiments existing even today, to become a reggae artist in Jamaica, it was like wanting to pick up garbage every day. It was absolutely seen to be the lowest of the low because it was associated with the people in the society, the underclass, the lower classes, the people who are rasters, who have always been there giving Jamaica vision. So today, what has occurred is that the university, through the Reggae Studies Unit, through the Institute of Caribbean Studies, where the Reggae Studies Unit is located, we have been training people and developing that critical mass of people who have an appreciation for entertainment and cultural enterprise management, so not just event management, Jerome, the context of the broader cultural and creative industries in which you can then apply cultural studies as a body of knowledge around finding an interpretation and solutions for the social reality. So some of the things that are lacking would be things like entertainment management. Some of the artists in Jamaica don't have managers. Your brother managing you, your sister managing you, your cousin managing you. And they may not even be um, appreciating the fact that management is something you have to study. That's just one example. The other example I like to talk about is the way in which Jamaica has been the only country on the planet to give eight, in, depending on who you're talking to, 15 genres of music. In the latter half of the 20th century, we're talking about a 50 year span. That's not a lot of time. In fact, as we were talking and walking today in Benicassim um, and in Castellon, one of the things we, we, we observed, and I, I, I reiterated with Lydia, who I was talking with, that the three countries in the world to have the biggest export in music are the United States with 340 something million people, Britain with a whole heap of other million people, and little Jamaica with three million people. The only three countries with the largest export in music, all right? So Jamaica, essentially, in trying to understand what it has given the world, there are programs, there are institutions like the Reggae, Reggae Studies Unit and its programmatic offerings that have begun to make a dent in the kind of gaps we have seen both at the educational level and also at the training and skills level. So it's pretty phenomenal that the University of the West Indies has a Reggae Studies Unit. Where else in the world should have a Reggae Studies Unit but in Jamaica? And I think that we beat up ourselves all the time, but we must acknowledge that to be one of the successes. And I think I'm happy, I'm privileged to be playing a role in that institute and to be one of those people looking at students who then I can buck up in a reggae festival like this because they're playing in bands, they're managing people, they're playing their role. Yeah. So, so um, Sonia, both... Um what you and Jerome were saying really speaks to an ongoing stigma attached to reggae music and a, a lack of credibility in terms of the industry, in terms of how it's viewed in the wider Jamaican society. Um, but do each of you on this panel feel that that's changing? And, and Sonia, I do applaud the work that you're doing at the University of the West Indies, and I would encourage everyone here who's interested in these topics and in reggae and Jamaican culture more generally to consider coming down to Jamaica for the next Global Reggae Conference, which will be in, held in February 2019. What, what are the exact dates? February 13 to 16, 2019. Please come. And we are not going to have a conversation as academics alone. We want practitioners. We want people who are involved in the music. We want people who love the music to be there with us and to give us feedback about what it is we're doing. So you are all a part of the conversation, not just you sitting here, but those who will absolutely watch this video online later on as well. So Jerome, Gussie, and Sonia, do you feel that the stigma is waning in Jamaica? Is Jamaica beginning to wake up 
to the fact that this industry is a worldwide, an industry of worldwide importance and that the music and culture deserves to be taken seriously. And can I just kind of say that, just, just one thing before I, I pass to the other panelists. Jamaica is a country of hypocrisy. Let's just admit that that occurs as well. There are politicians who, in their electioneering activities, constantly have the music on their political platforms. But at the next minute, when it is time to make a policy or to give funding to an activity that's going to push the industry forward, they back away. This happens. It probably happens in many other countries as well because of the, 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 the kind of imperatives that politicians have to, to win elections, right? But in spite of that, there are a lot of people who are working towards the goal of putting reggae where it needs to be, putting Jamaican music where it needs to be. And it's not just the educators, obviously. It is people like Jerome, people like Gossie, and the people that they are training, even when they don't know that they are training these people, the people around them who are their apprentices. One of the things I, I have said in, in various settings is that we have kind of forgotten that apprenticeship is important in this business that you are not going to become an expert until you have a period of apprenticeship and you can go to school all you like but the activity of training in an institution is very different from other job training and that apprenticeship we had it sir cox and dodd had all of the people around him you know it, it, it's it's just there that the, the 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 business of apprenticeship is important so when it comes on to the, the, the reggae music industry, I will say yes, it is changing. That stigma is changing because there is now developing a critical mass of people who have a different appreciation. When my son comes to me and says to me, mommy, I want to study music, I am not going to have a challenge with that. I am going to be able to steer him to the kinds of courses, programs, organizations in which he's going to need to be apprenticed in. And I, I expect this is what will happen with a, with, with a number of people now at my level, at my age, that I'm also be able to advise people and they will take my advice. So there is a critical mass of people who are actively dealing with that stigma and making it go away. Thank you. Um, yeah, maybe we get a comment also from Jesse and Jerome and Pat. How would you view the state of the art of reggae music today? Is it up to where it should be, or maybe your point of views? Um, I, would, I would like to speak more the the booking aspect, where it is. Um, a couple of things. I would say it's mixed. I would say, firstly, we have seen some things that have gone well. Um, without going too much repetition, where the business has grown. There are more artists that I think, for example, if you look at Europe now versus Europe 10, 15 years ago, the amount of artists that are on the road, the amount of artists Romain is leaving here and going to us in Slovakia, you know, that wouldn't have happened a long time ago. Um, we've seen certain markets grow in terms of how um, it have had led to bigger shows and bigger concerts. The Caribbean has become a very big market uh, for, I think, uh, in terms of our earning potential, is one of the biggest markets where there are eight to ten countries where the artist earn, earns well. Um, the, the East Coast and the West Coast in America is picking up, so I, I think there, there is some of that, that it is good. Uh, I think as well also the product, however, is not as good as it should be on an overall basis. I think the product of what is being put out a lot of times, the, the standard is, is not the strongest. And I think we need to see an improvement in that, uh, you know. We'd like to see better productions. I, one of the weaknesses, I think, of reggae music um, sometimes is the lack of appreciation of repeat value. The possibility that you will do another concert, you'll go to another engagement, another festival, based on how you present yourself on stage and how you present yourself off stage. And both are big weaknesses in the industry. And uh, has a lot of time has you know worked against us. So uh, there there are a combination of factors that I think they work towards. Mike, yeah, I think it's a combination of many different things. And I think one of the thing that is an issue. I think Bob Marley, as we know, Jamaica said, "Broke bad." 
we are expecting another Bob Marley and we are expecting a standard of Bob Marley and we are measuring it on a Bob Marley. Not wrong with that, perfectly great. But if we look since then, there's a lot of other upcoming artists who have broken out and are doing well. The Knowns, the Chronics, the Kabaka Pyramid, the Protégé. And there's a whole new set of other artists evolving and coming on stream. And I think, you know, within time, they will evolve. I will agree that, you know, we all believe that we could have a lot more greater artists, but it's just, I've come to the reality that the process is going to take a whole time. Because nowadays, you know, it's not just the music again. They are basically ambassadors. They are selling the religion, the food, the clothes, the walk, the talk. So if we take a little bit more time and if a lot of them are willing to listen and to understand the whole aspect of business, we move to a generation where we're doing things about love and you know, we just love the music and we are doing it right in this business. And we need to, you know, we have what I repetitively tend to say is used as a me factor. You have artists who like to say, boy, I'm me the producer, me the engineer, me write my song, I'm me and my manager, me this. But too much of them lack the competency in the areas of which they are claiming control or want to do. So in doing so, they could be gaining, if not doing it that way, they could be gaining from the expertise of other professionals who have experience and who are taught, and many of them career would go further in a faster time internationally. Um, Pat, Thank maybe you. you can also comment on the state of art of the industry. What is your view about it? Um, I would like to see more accountability for what reggae is actually doing in the global marketplace. Um, we know that, for example, Billboard, we have reggae charts, but we know that that's only based on one, one uh, metric, and that would be sound scan, Nielsen sound scan sales. And we know sales, even in the heyday of record sales, reggae sales were never really much to speak of. So nowadays when the bigger genres are not even selling, well, what does that say about reggae? So for, and as an example, could look at Chronix had a, such a successful US tour last year, um, his chronology tour, but the album, I don't even know if it has sold 5,000 copies according to SoundScan, yet we, that doesn't begin to quantify the impact Chronix is having in, in the US, which is such a difficult market for reggae, but also globally. You know, so I would love to see the development of more accountable metrics, more accountable data, because the more you have that, it's greater leverage to just go and get more things done, that it can be greater tour support, it can be endorsement deals, it can be further licensing for songs because if uh, a company should see that, wow, I look at this artist and they all these numbers that come up, well, I want him or her associated with my product and I have to ha add in her. We definitely want to see a greater role for our female artists. It's just so sad that <laughs> it's just not risen to the level that their talent warrants and you know that's something personally in my writing I hope to highlight even more I'm really trying to make more of a conscious effort of that and um, to the point about yes a, a greater quality in the music I think there's been consistently in my years of doing this um, been such great music coming from Jamaica now we have other places making great reggae but to speak of Jamaica, such great music coming from Jamaica, just not getting its due, just not getting its fair shake in the marketplace. I, you know, I would love to see more, that's when you, a uh, concerted team, a focused team can help with that. We don't really, the labels, as I mentioned back in the day, they don't really play the role they once did if they ever did for reggae. I mean, you know, to give them their due, yes, they did to an extent, but it's always been about the artist and his team doing what they can on the ground. I would love to see artists learn from the previous generations. There are so many examples out there, like really study 
what have been the downfalls of some artists and try not to let that happen to you. We all make mistakes, but when there's a series of the same mistakes being made and that's impeding the growth overall, you can, it's easy to change when you just study. So greater study, greater accountability, and the quality music. It's never been a problem of quality for me. Yeah, there's some things, not so good, but there's many things that are great that just are not getting what they deserve. So be greater recognition for everything that's out there and greater quantification, if there's such a word, um, for sure. what the music is actually doing in the marketplace. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. No, well, um, I do have maybe a selfish worry, you know. Uh, it's my first time uh, at Rotterdam, and thanks again, Sabrina, and, and for having me. But I'm a bit worried as a Jamaican in the music business. Um, from the packaging of the event, we don't have any major event. A lot of people who are not familiar with Jamaica will be so, so surprised when they come to Jamaica um, as to how many good reggae events we have for them to attend to, whether it is a single artist event or whether it is a multi-artist event. You know, a lot of people have that utopic view, but it doesn't exist. Um, I, I'm worried from the point of view of the branding with the exceptions and the fact that Pat and, and, and us have to pick exceptions shows exactly where the Jamaican brand it is. What is successful or what is really successful has been exceptions and not the norm. So I'm worried from the fact that I'm here tonight and I see a great lineup and people are telling me so much about the artist. And not only, again, I'm speaking from a selfish perspective, are they mostly not Jamaicans? But myself and other Jamaicans are not aware of them. So only, not only are we not involved, but we're ignorant of what is happening outside of our world. So when I was asked and I was thinking where Jamaican reggae is, uh, you know, I, I, I had a view of it. And then coming to see some things here, you realize the weakness of, of, of the brand underground and the amount of things that we need to do to not even to make it grow, but just to make it maintain. There was a panel a couple of days ago and I'll wrap shortly. I spoke about Alpha and it, it, it's symbolic of so many things in Jamaica where uh, the assistant and the drive, and, I, and the book was written by somebody outside. The main person on the ground is, is Josh Chamberlain from U.S. The, the, um, the, the deputy ambassador was speaking about helping and getting Jamaicans to help because it's a product that we have not bought into and so many other people have. And I'm hoping I'll be able to go home and convince some people that we, we should do better. Thank you. Yes, thank you uh, so much, Jerome. But I, I have to say, as a traveler to Jamaica, you know, I could never embrace the music the way if I wouldn't have been there. You know, I really, I really need to say this. And as David Rodigan said yesterday, the kindness and everything and the openness you know, as a foreigner, you can visit studios, you can go to dances, you are so welcome, it's amazing, it's really amazing. And then I always tell the Jamaican people, why don't you love the music as we white, crazy white people love the music, you know? I think maybe it's, it's something when you have it all around you, when you grew up, it's, you know, on the radio 24 seven to kind of appreciate the way, you know, we don't have it that way. And for us, it's, it's difficult. It's different. I don't know if you want to make a comment on that. Um, not so much on, on that specifically, but I, I, I was sitting here and recalling some of the things I tell my students as I'm teaching. One of the things I tell my students is that they're going to leave Jamaica and they're going to be embarrassed because there are people outside of Jamaica who know more about Jamaica than they do. And, and, and I, I make, I'm making that point because it is so important for Jamaicans to learn about their own country, their own cultural products. And, and the point I'm really getting at is that it is so important for the artists to learn about the product that they are involved in. And so Gossie has made the point, Jerome has made the point, um, Pat has made the point. 
one of the things I really dream of is being able to have a space like this, and I'm sitting here speaking, and it's only artists that are sitting here. And I can play the, 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 the long, deep, broad catalog of Jamaican rhythms and Jamaican music to illustrate the history and evolution of the business. There are lots of artists who them have a computer, they can make a rhythm, somebody can make a rhythm for them, they can jump on the rhythm, they can be booked on a festival here and there, but as Rodigan said yesterday, hype over substance cannot be sustained. And it becomes so important because all that is necessary in that equation is for the artist to begin to take as priority, as number one priority, learning about their own craft, learning about the business, learning about the history of the business that they're a part of. So that's really my wish. That's, that's one of the things I'm going to have to figure out now how to get this done. Yes. Now, now Jerome, you just mentioned about reggae festivals here in Europe and Rototom compared to reggae festivals in Jamaica. And when I think about Jamaica in terms of reggae festivals, I'm thinking about its long, rich history of presenting a series of very successful and very inspiring music festivals with Jamaican music at the center of it. And of course, the biggest and most iconic that comes to mind is the original Reggae Sun Splash. You know, there was nothing like it in this world, and it successfully ran for what, about 20 years? Well, yes, just yeah. under, just under. And went on to inspire other festivals, including this very one that we are at here. Then, of course, you had Sting as a dance hall festival and Reggae Sumfest, which is still going in some form but has changed hands recently. So I wondered if you could speak a little bit about the climate in Jamaica for festivals. You know, what festivals have managed to sustain that length of time, like this festival here? And if they haven't managed to do that, why not? And, you know, what, what's the situation on the ground in Jamaica regarding music festivals? Um, the concept of the festival in Jamaica is, is different from what I've seen here, what I've seen at other festivals. Uh, we traditionally do one main stage um, for the festival, um, sometimes not even a second stage. Um, our festival, reggae, some festivals in, in its present format, is traditional events that starts at eight, nine o'clock and will be done by six o'clock. And it's a, a continuation of performers on the same stage. Some people put out an extra presentation. It, it tends to bring together the strongest lineup um, on the island. But if we were to, to backtrack a bit, yes, it started with the reggae sun splash. The music grew so well that Ronnie Burke and company decided they should put together a festival when Jamaica had nothing, no light, no stage. Uh, and the story is long and hard, but they were able to present an event for new music that attracted foreigners along with Jamaicans to an event, which was much more than just what happened on stage, which was much more than just over the years what was popular. We learned about so many other things that reggae influenced because you had World Beat Night, and we, you know, we learned so much about the music then. But I think then it was a presentation to show the music and the culture. Uh, what it has grown into, I think, really not taken away because maybe that is a successful commercial model. It's really an extended concert. You know, there are very few uh, attractions or any point of interest outside of that. Um, and culturally, we've never had that on a wide scale level. Um, the concert business in Jamaica, not sounding pessimistic, but we, we don't have a plethora of concerts as we used to. It's not as successful. Uh, I think it's a combination of things. It's maybe, you know, sand at the beach. We have so much artists, so many events. They appear in so many formats, whether it's a sponsored event, whether it's a party. Um, plus, it's an expensive business. So Jamaica, to me, and it has been for a long time, and maybe for business, it's more a factory for the, for the music, but it's not a great show place, really, and it's certainly not a great earning place. Uh, one US dollar is 130, 130 uh, Jamaican dollars, you know, so therefore the dollar value is, it doesn't make it successful. So you, when you go to the Caribbean, you make 15 times what you make in Jamaica when you go to Europe, 10, eight times, etc. 
So the, the, the live business in Jamaica is, is not as big as it should be on one level, you know, on a private level, but in terms of major concerts. And our festival doesn't carry diversity of any kind uh, in terms of the music package. And um, hopefully we can change some of that soon. Okay. That, yeah, I think, oh, yeah, go ahead. I, I would like to step back a bit to go over the point to understand that the quality of the product we are creating needs to be seriously looked at. Every artist is an artist, but you are not necessarily a great artist or an exceptional artist. And I don't think we have the comparative from now to then, we have the same degree of great artist as we had before. A simple fact for me has always been, if 35 years after his death, Bob Marley is selling more record than everybody put together, something was right then and something is wrong now. We have to go back there. I could never understand, I would see an upcoming artist and he would say to me, I am working on my album, I am working on my EP. And I said to him, say, well, your album and your EP. So, have you made one good record hit yet? No, but my, my album. So that thinking is a trend and a fad. So if you can't make one good record, why people who are here 10 or 15 more of you, makes no sense in reality to me. So we have to go back to look at the quality of the content of what we are creating. What you do today, Barry Salmon after about 30 years or 25 years, is singing songs that everybody knows today. You can't remember some of the hit songs that some of the famous artists did last year in Jamaica. So the, there's no longevity, there's the essence, his loss or is being lost somehow in numbers and volume rather than the quality of the content. We have the talent, we have the ability, but people also have to be willing to listen, to learn, to hear. There's all this argument of, okay, record company, um, not doing enough to promote my record. But you probably didn't give them a good record to use to sell. Record companies are about making money. So if you don't make a great record, why is anybody going to invest in promoting it? Because you feel you made a great record. So we have to go back to the creation of the product from the ground where people know needs to listen, probably to learn, to understand that it's not just about what you think, it's about what you create. Because 30 years from now, either you're going to be still be doing well, or you might be hungry. There is, there is something, colleagues, that um, Jerome said, which I don't want us to gloss over. It's very important. Jerome said the word show in Jamaica. The, 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 the context of Jamaica for shows is not really a good one. And I, I don't want us to gloss over it in because part of why we are not producing the kind of quality that Gussie is talking about is that we have not actually given our artists a context for, for giving us shows. Do you know that the promoters are to blame for that? That when we book 10 artists in a, in a, in a, in a night to, to do a show, and each of them come on the stage and can only do five minutes and 10 minutes and 15 minutes. We are actually not giving our artists the opportunity to do a show. I mean, I remember friends of mine saying, you know, people would go to them to ask them to manage them. And when, when they say, you know, friends of mine will say, well, all right, you want me to manage you? Let's start. I'm going to need you to get up in the mornings run for half an hour or 45 minutes, and in the evenings, again, you're going to do some other form of exercise. And they'll look at my friend and say, I can call his name, Nigel Staff, rough cut band. They'll say to him, but I'm not trying to train for track. And they actually don't understand as artists that really and truly, that kind of exercise is what's going to sustain you on a stage when you go to perform. You yeah. cannot be up there singing and out of breath or singing, performing, dancing, and out of breath. Yeah. And I'm suggesting, I'm suggesting that in the same way that we are expecting the artists to be fit, the promoters must do what is necessary to give those artists the opportunity to show their fitness, those of them who have achieved it. Because many of them are actually not getting the opportunity to give a show in Jamaica. Thank you. Yes, Pat. I just wanted to speak to um, Gussie's comment about Bob Marley outselling 
every artist, and of course that's true, but uh, the Marley Estate has teams of people, day in and day out. It is their job to sell you Bob Marley. His wonderful music, his standard setting music notwithstanding, that is their full-time job to sell Bob Marley to you, be it on a bottle of water, on a teacup, on a pair of shoes, and in film, and whatever it is. And, you know, and to their credit, some people might say it's over the top, it's too much, but to their credit, that's what they do, and in doing it, they do it very well. The average artist does not have those kind of financial resources, nor do they have a team like that. The average artist just wouldn't have that at their disposal. And I do feel there have been many great albums over the years that have been by the wayside. Just to call a name, because I was watching him perform last night, um, the great Dwayne Stevenson from Jamaica released two that, two that I recall, two beautiful albums for VP Records. This is not to slight that label, because they've done some great work. But when you have so many artists signed and you have a skeletal staff, there's a lot of great work that will fall through the cracks. So perhaps That's if true. Dwayne, you know, at the time he was upcoming and in fact still is, but he is a brilliant singer songwriter and there are many who, you know, because they don't have the resources to hire people to get their music out, if they're dependent on a label and they're dependent on a publicist who's got 10 other projects that they've got to get placed that day, there's some great things that fall through the cracks. It's not to say that there aren't some substandard products being released that also turn people off and say, this is what's coming out of Jamaica now, I'm not interested. But you know, that is the flip side to that is there is some great products, again, coming from everywhere. But if people don't have the resources which the average artist does not, be, and it's a catch-22 because you, the resources go into the record. You need the record to get the shows, right. but if the record don't sell, where do you get the money back from to get the shows? To, so it's this, you know, it's a, it's a t confusing cycle. And um, yeah, but I just want to make that point the, to Marley. The, you have great music to start with to market, but it is marketing genius behind all of that. Thank you. Now, just, just a quick time check, just to remind, we're almost reaching the time when we're going to put the question, the questions to you, the good people at uh, the Reagan University, to put your questions to our special panelists. But meanwhile, come in, Pete. Yeah, before we do that, I would like to, um, to, di well, to direct the attention to positive examples, like, for example, Protégé or Chronix who, yes, they take well care of their art, but I also think they do other things different from, from their peers or from, their, um, from previous generations, like putting on stage shows in Jamaica themselves that you know, sell very well, or they fill um, venues of capacities like five to 10,000 people when they performed in New York, I think, recently. And um, to our panelists, what, what do you think they are doing differently on a business level, not oh, we can hear the art, the quality of the music, but what are they doing differently, business-wise? Um, oh, well, I think I can speak because um, the chronic shows we've done um, eight of them so far, two sets of threes, and then uh, two big concerts at the end um, with them in Jamaica. And as a specific example. Uh, and I would stop to say one of the things that has been good for Jamaican reggae music, and you don't want some time to seem biased, but um, Kranich's music and his approach to the business of music um, has been refreshing um, as somebody young, but having a clear vision very early of how he would like to set some things. Uh, use the example as well as Protégé, yes. But these were people believing more in the value and I, I'm glad I got the chance to say it because with that said, there has been a birth of some people without certain background training that have taken a new approach to music and some people call it, you know, a resurgence in reggae. Uh, you know, I wouldn't, I would love to hear what a purist like Gussie feels about it, but as a booking agent, um, it was a good feel for the industry um, to see traditional uh, reggae artists you know, that uh, unlike Sean or Shaggy had a pop element, um, unlike Sean or Shaggy had a, a, a back from the streets hardcore background that came up uh, and, and helped to create and be a part of a wave. And I think that was good for the music. I think 
they took a, a new approach to it and, and, and a serious approach to it, and they created a team and they created partnerships with other people of experience. Using myself as an example, using other players who uh, it would be their right to call the names that advise them in different things, in publishing, in recording, in, you know, in performance, in a number of things. Um, and I think there, 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 are groups, there are groups, that's the second time that's happened. There are groups there that have, have taken their approach of take it a bit more serious. You see it with how they move their merch on the road. Their number of acts carrying their merchandise on the road. They're creating more content. They're, they're using the current day. So I think there is a young, at the same time, what is refreshing for me from Jamaica, that there's an approach by a younger generation to, to work with older people, but at the same time, create their own brand and, and build it well. Um, I think one of the things is that using the chronics and many more like chronics is that there's a different sense of motivation. For them, I think it's my career first, not the money. And when you focus on the money first, you distort possibilities that you don't even know about. And that is one of the biggest complaints about artists. Now, what chronics, using him as an example, has done is invest in himself today so that tomorrow his legacy will stand and whatever he's doing will seem to be hopefully a benchmark. And those people provide source of information to upcoming. But if the first thing somebody is going to tell you, if you are not giving me X, me can't, me not do it. Sometimes it's an opportunity that can lead to greater opportunities. And they don't go for that first. And that's one of the biggest problems. Thank you. The only thing I would like to add to the, 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 the very sober comments that have been made already in relation to this matter is the fact that chronics, we need not forget that there is a meditation element. And that meditation element I'm talking about is what makes one understand intuitively that reggae is about family and spirit. And I think chronics understands that. I, I think he understands that because what has manifested in his, in, his, in his approach, in his understanding of the business model he needed to create, and I've kind of heard him say this, is a way in which he decided to build a family of followers at home and then subsequently abroad to, 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 to actually carry him when he begins to fly. And it's a very interesting kind of analogy because... What is going to sustain you at the bottom if you haven't built that support? When you get up into the air, what is going to keep you up there if you don't have people buying your records, if you don't have people going to your concert, if you don't have people really looking out for the next product from you? And I think that's something that many of the artists need to, need to, need to pay attention to. The other person I want to reference, um, you know, Pat has so put, put so well the whole context of the, of the, of the Marley legacy the Marley, not only the Marley legacy, but the Marley empire. These people understand themselves to be operating in an empire. And I think that's what Chronix understands. He's trying to build an empire. He may not have come from the kind of legacy that a Junior Gong has come from. When you hear Junior Gong speak, I mean, one of the things I, I marvel at is the fact that you ever hear any of them, you know, cascas, anybody reporting negatively about any of the Marleys, it's just not going to happen. Whether it is that they are going to pay somebody to take that story down or not, the fact is that you're not going to see anything negative because when they actually get up to speak, they understand that they are speaking from the standpoint of an empire and that there's something to protect. Many of our artists don't understand that. And I'm wondering if, you know, am I going to have to take each of them aside and, and, and tell them to them ears, like whisper and say, hey, you know, you're building an empire. Take it easy. Thank you. Pat? Okay, yeah, let's please open it oh, up. Oh, Otherwise, oh. we don't, you know. Oh, oh, David, you had another comment? No, just okay. last, yeah, last okay. comment from Pat. Uh, okay, I just Sorry, wanted to make a, yeah. we'll a comment um, about Junior Gong and the success of his Welcome to Jamrock Cruise. And I know we have real hardcore cruisers here in the audience. And um, just the success of that event 
is again another marker for, yeah, we don't have the record sales, we don't have the radio airplay, but we have people from all over the world who want to go to that event. And, you know, the 2018 edition, which takes place in December, has been sold out for many months. 2019 looks to be well on its way for that. And, you know, that's like 18 months away or, or more. So, um, again, it's about, as Pete had mentioned, you know, artists like protege chronics doing their own events saying you know rather than try to fit into something that's existing which is fine too that's a fine approach but let's build up new spaces let's build up new venues new new concepts to present this music in as a just a new way of doing business so i just wanted to recognize the cruise as being something uh, a benchmark for showing what the music is doing in the marketplace, even if it's not doing it according to record sales and according to radio airplay. Thank you. Okay. okay. Yeah. So yeah, let's open things up. Now is that okay? See, we have a question. A couple questions over here. So yeah. Hold, hold on. Wait. Wait for the microphone, please. Hello, panelists. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sandra Edward Smith. I write for an online magazine called redcarpetshelly.com, and we have a friendly war of words with um, DJ Roy. And we always say to him, whenever we go to shows, concerts, there are very few women. And his words were, the women of reggae do not work as hard as the men. So we're like, we're so angry with him for that comment. But I guess I'd like to have your opinion. Whenever we go to concerts, um, every now and again, you might see Queen Africa, you might see Janine, you might see Etana, but there's a plethora of good women talent in reggae, and we're hardly seeing them on many venues. What is your opinion? I would, Thank you. I have, it's, it, it's, a, it's a great question, but personally, I've always been of the view that it's data, it's mathematics, it's numbers. If in the industry of using a number for conversation, 100 men and 10 women, there's a greater number of male performers, lead performers in the industry than females, so automatically, it ends up in that kind of an imbalance. I don't think there's a lack of opportunity. I personally never don't believe that there's an entitlement because they are females. I believe that we could, we should, and or could look at a balance when you know someone stands up. But I just think it's just numbers really lead to it. If you know all painters were, you know, it's just numbers for me. I have always seen it that way. Any other comments from the panel? From a booking point of view, I, I have always been amazed on the disparity in the music business um, on the success of female artists versus male. It, it's amazing, uh, the difference. And uh, it seems like there's a ceiling. It's so hard when you're booking concerts, when you, after you go one, two acts, you don't have anybody with a big enough catalog to do an hour. Um, so uh, somehow the music, it's not coming from the music because the concerts lead generally from the music. But I really, I hope it, w I really wish it would change. Worldwide, it is not as bad as the same level as in reggae music. Some say it, it's a very male chauvinistic atmosphere. Some say it's a difficult um, environment for women. I've heard women say that, so I must be fair for them to thrive and survive him. Um, without the sexual overtone, you know, I, I've heard that, that that's a big problem for women. I don't can't say how true it is, but I've always wondered about it, and it does affect us from a working point of view. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Go uh, ahead. I just want to thank the panel for the presentation um, that you've made so far. I'm a Jamaican and this is my first time visiting the festival and I'm blown. You know, I, I just um, read an article uh, from 2015 where the author describes Rotterdam as the veritable Disneyland of reggae. And I mean, it, it is true to, 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 to go to some of the points that were made earlier. My question is, how do you, and I'd like to hear from each member of the panel, how do you see 
outsiders are helping with the development of the, you know, a festival scene, say, and by extension, improvement of the Jamaican uh, music uh, and, and having more people coming to participate in reggae in Jamaica. You know, as, as you walk through the festival grounds, the, the people I see are not necessarily people who would stay in the all-inclusives. And it speaks to a point that Sonia made about, uh, you know, really what is the class divide and the structures and the people who control on the Jamaican landscape. And therefore, you know, there may be a role for people who are on the outside to have an impact, to help those of us on the inside who would like to have an impact and who would like to see a change and would like to bring more of the persons who would participate in festivals like these to Jamaica to experience that home of the Disneyland that, that, that spoken from or spoken about. So, you know, just for each of you to comment, uh, how do you see foreigners participating in that process? What, what, what are your suggestions? I'll start as one of the, I'm American, born and raised, and it's where I live, and, but I'm a regular visitor to Jamaica, and I've attended um, every reggae sum fest except for one over the past 25 years, and I, I was really pleased with what I saw this year at reggae sum fest. The new owner, Mr. Joseph Bogdanovich, who took it over two years ago, I believe, he um, He's been a long time investor in the music of Jamaica with varying degrees of success, but he does seem to really have a commitment to growing the festival, to expanding it. And I think that um, he instituted a, a panel discussion segment cha chaired by, put together by Dr. Naya, and it was very well received. The attendance could have been better, but I know, it, from what I know, he's committed to that. Of course, he could speak to that. He's committed to growing that. The grounds of the festival have been, you know, a lot of work was done to implement different attractions and different, just different things to do, like when you're not looking at the stage to walk around, more diversity of vendors, diversity of, of food offerings, various things. So I think for, um, to your question about outsiders, I think it's all about feedback. I'm sure there's, on the SumFest website, you could contribute comments. I know he, in my travels to Jamaica, I know he's, he's someone I've known from the 1990s when he first started going there. He's definitely someone I would want to dialogue with about my experiences here, what I think, you know, could, some fest could adapt, as I know you would too, Dr. Naya. So um, I just think it's best to let your comments be known. And I think all of us who are so into reggae, and especially those of us who live in Jamaica, but then those of us who are regular visitors there, want to see Jamaica have a greater presence on the festival circuit. Want some fest, Rebel Salute, the few remaining festivals that are there to be talked about in a way that, you know, you really can't miss them or you really feel that, you know, besides the great music coming from there that you also get a full festival experience. So we just want to possible, as much as possible, convey our positive experiences when we travel abroad and share those with the powers that be so they can implement what suggestions make sense to them. Thank you. Yeah. I'm thinking that it'd be great. It might be a bit idealistic, but we it's time for a new event in Jamaica. Looking at Rotterdam, and I don't think we should think it is not time for a new kind of event in Jamaica. Uh, I think if this is the Disneyland of reggae, then we need somehow to take, to find a way to bring a core of people back to Jamaica for a Jamaican reggae experience. But we see, for example, some of the things that work here that are not traditionally done this way in Jamaica, and we find a hybrid of a product. Um, that would be really what I'd like to see. I, I would like to see some of the income that is generated from the business of reggae going back to Jamaica because the social decay in Jamaica is so deep and so harsh and the opportunities are so limited that I'm hoping that somehow some of the people that 
benefit from the music would find a way to contribute where it doesn't go back to any individual. It, it might be idealistic, but it, that's one of the most painful experiences for me here when I realize how big and how much and how many people are here and vendors and so much activity and so much comeback. But I know a lot of the people who did the songs, who do the work, who work in the business, who work in the country will never gain. So I'm hoping we can find a connect where there is more that get back. The last one I would really like to see is, I would like to see a, a greater cooperation. You know, I'd like to see where the music and the talent, a lot of it is from Jamaica, but that is also elsewhere. But in Europe and in other first world countries, there are certain advantages, there are certain experiences. There are people who manage artists that sell millions. We have had only two or three that have ever sold millions. So I'm hoping that enough of them will take interest, would form partnership with some of the more forward-thinking people and say, let us make this a better brand. Because reggae is now bigger than Jamaica. But for us from Jamaica, this is our oil and gold. So I'm hoping that we can hold on to a little of it. Thank you. Mao, that your question slash comment which you, you pretty much answered to, is um, it very much goes to the question of building bridges. Pat's comment, for example, showed clearly that there are people from outside who are doing a lot. There are people here who travel to Jamaica for festivals. When I go to some fest and I do research, asking people where they are from, I look at the Jamaica Tourist Board and the research that they have done, looking at where people who attend those festivals come from. Those people, there are people who are coming from outside, doing what they used to do for reggae sunsplash, leaving their, their, their countries, saving their monies, and flying to Jamaica. What we need is more of that. So what I'm talking about is, is bridging the divide in a very serious way. And inside of Jamaica, there are some things that have to change for that bridge to be built rebuilt. The people in Jamaica who are tasked with marketing the events, developing events, they also have a role to play. One of the things I've, I've been bemoaning is the fact that the partners outside of Jamaica that are marketing Jamaica are not necessarily marketing the things that have put Jamaica on the map. They are marketing some other things. I don't know what it is they're doing. But they are not in these spaces talking to people sharing with people, building that bridge that I'm talking about. And I think we have to take responsibility at home as well in terms of the building of that bridge. Thank you. So I think, yeah, go, go ahead. Just to give yeah. a quick yeah, well, answer to the same question. I don't think it's a good idea for foreigners to come to Jamaica and try and run a show for us. Not a good idea. Culturally, there's going to be challenges and it's going to feel very uncomfortable. Yes, you have the experience, you have the technical, there should be a way to work together, but to come to Jamaica and run it, I don't think it's a good idea. Are workable? Thank you. So yeah, yeah. Go, go on, yeah. yeah. All right. So um, I'm a part of the University of the West Indies. I'm Professor Donna Hope, and I'm here. Um, this is my third time at Rotterdam, and one of the things that I recognize from a lot of the discussions is that most Jamaicans, when they come to Rotterdam for the first time, and they see the way that the, the thing has been built out, and the way that reggae, Jamaican music, and Jamaican culture, and Rastafari, the thematic strands that are pulled forward in this kind of festival, and the response to it, they are blown away. My comment and question, of course, to the panel is that in the discussions that we have been having about what happens in the reggae industry and the dance hall industry in Jamaica, we should speak to the, the a kind of diversities and the hierarchies that exist in Jamaican society, the issue of social power and economic power. There's a great deal of music on the ground that doesn't go up to the highest level. So there's a lot of work being done on the ground by many musicians, many artists, but because the access is limited, who they are, and who they have access to, what kind of money they have access to. It means that many of you will never hear about them. Eh? And so the Bob Marley example has become the kind of sterling example that many people try to imitate, that one that is held up for many people to see. But 
a great deal is happening on the ground. Many of the young men and women, the point the sister made here, are not getting the kind of opportunities to be heard and seen. And a lot of the work that we have to do on the ground in Jamaica and others who are outside, for example, Pat spoke about Dwayne Stevens's album, August Town, one of those big albums, very powerful. Many people have not heard about that album because the networks are not as clearly available in the same way that it might be available for some of the artists, young and old, new and um, emerging, who have access, and we have to be clear on this, access to various kinds of resources. And so I'm putting a question to some of my colleagues here on the panel. We are doing work at the University of the West Indies. Um, we come here to do research. We write about this festival. We document it. We give interviews in the media. But what do you see as the kind of mechanisms that we can build out, um, and I'm putting it to the four members of the panel, that can help us in Jamaica, artists in Jamaica, promoters, producers, and others in the industry to see the reggae music and the dancehall music, the Jamaican music industry, in a more all-encompassing fashion so that we can energize and improve the product for visibility as well as for the access to, eh, by people from outside as well as those inside. In a, in, a, in a large way, I've said on this panel already three different things. One is to expose artists to the deep history. One is to um, continue in the ways that we have been doing to, to document and to educate, generally at the University of the West Indies in terms of programs we're, we're building. And I think a third, a third thing has to do with being able to take responsibility as educators as people who are marketing, as people who are on the ground in Jamaica, to make sure that our voices are heard. When I go back home, I mean, I've been here, and there are people writing me about interviews already. And, and that's something important, because it means that some tweet that I've tweeted, something that I've done has caused people to understand that this is a ground that I've visited, and something I'm interested in, so that they must become interested in it as well. So I make sure to take responsibility for educating. That's my role. I'm not, I can't sing, I, I, I can't put on a show, I'm an educator, that's what I'm going to continue to do, and do it formidably. So I think, I think, yeah. Time, time for the last two questions. Can I provide an answer to the yeah, question? Yeah, go ahead. In Jamaica, on the ground, there is serious inherent problem that has to be corrected there first. One. In Jamaica, they're playing 70% of foreign music on the radio. That has to be corrected. In Jamaica, 70% of the income earned from the whole copyright usage goes back to foreign. So if we ourselves is not fully endorsing our product, what do we expect? It's going to take us a longer time to reach well, where we should well be. Said, Those well are a couple said. of things. capacity in whatever roles that we have, you know, that is where we can make our difference. Um, Sandy, before you came in, I had made a comment about, as a female writer, I'm really trying to make a conscious emphasis, emphasis to highlight more females just to help rebalance. And I mean, sometimes it's, it's thankless, you know, but um, just, that's just one aspect of it. And in everything that I try to do, um, whatever, wherever, the reggae might be coming from. I do write predominantly about Jamaican reggae, but wherever the reggae might be coming from, um, there's always a mention of Jamaica in there. And um, I try to, every year for the past, I'd say six or seven years, we've coordinated with International Reggae Day, founded by Andrea Davis in Kingston, Jamaica. And whatever that theme that they're celebrating for that year, be it Rocksteady, Dub, whatever they've done, I always try to coordinate a story to run on July 1st so that it's helping to celebrate something else that came from Jamaica. And this year as the 50th anniversary, just thought to look at 1968, like what was going on in the country and then maybe beyond that helped influence the development of this sound. And, you know, my highlight in all of that was speaking to the great Bob Andy, who I'd never had the privilege to interview before and then a couple of weeks later I was so 
thrilled to see he was honored at Reggae Sumfest, and I thought that's a great step in the right direction for Sumfest to have made to honor an icon like that while he's still alive and can walk on the stage and get the award and play some songs. And, you know, so I think just whatever, our, whatever roles we're in, you just try to play them to the best of the ability that you can. But I, from my work, it's always been about and will continue to be highlighting the roots of where this comes from because I love, I, love I love music history more than... If they taught music history in school in terms of history, I know I would have been a better student than I was. So that's what I try to highlight. Yes. All right, thank you. Sorry, this is a little bit loud. Um, thank you guys very much for being here. It's so informative. Um, I'm a producer from London, and I'm a creative director for a record label called JOAT, and I've never seen a festival like this. I actually call it a village. It's a lot more like a village back home than like a music festival, and this is the power of what I've seen reggae, of the power of reggae. So my question is, you guys have been talking about artists and about all the struggles, and it's crazy as a UK artist, everything you've had to comment on Jamaican artists is a problem we're facing with youth around the world. You know, temptations with money, you can look at America, all of these like overnight successes that have no longevity and no understanding. But we as musicians in 2018, we seem to be fighting a losing battle. Our, the, the attention span of a human being because of things like social media has just gotten so small for those of us that make music for impact, especially reggae, which must never forget was a music of revolution, a music of somewhat of consciousness. So in the day of today's society, my question is, we, we, the music was made to fight Babylon, but we are trying to sell it in Babylon. And a lot of the struggles I find is dealing with the human, the human condition. With social media, trying to push our music, trying to get it out there, do you think that Jamaica and the, the artists in Jamaica, do you feel like they have, they're selling the message because they're trying to be more appealable? Maybe for them, maybe the quality is coming down because they don't see it being able to sell in its, in its, old, in its old form in, in maybe the Bob Marley days. Maybe they also see that they've got to change things up and they're just not hitting it. So do you feel, so to sum it all up, do you feel like, in, do you feel like the problem is with the youth culture or do you feel like it's actually with the talent of specific people in Jamaica? There's no silver bullet to the problem. And people tend to follow success. And if we try to facilitate great things, other persons will create great things to follow. So in Jamaica, currently music has been influenced by influence which is not necessarily where we were coming from as a innovative people. One thing is making music, but two is creating innovative music. Again, it still goes back to individuals. You have to willing to listen, you have to willing to hear, you have to willing to get the right people around you, you have to willing to spend your money, not, to, not, not the more willing to look at the money you're going to get today. So it's a whole plethora of issues. As, as you were taught, as you were taught, thank you very much for your question and, and for the recognition that we are here talking about Jamaican music, but the music industry globally looks kind of similar. It look it, it looks similar. Um, and you know, it's very interesting. What's really important is that artists begin to understand themselves. I think that's so crucial. Going back to the point you've made about the, the message in the music, the meditation behind the music, that reggae is revolutionary music. Remember that at the time when reggae emerged, we were living in a different world. So music, you know, it's, it's the same reason why when you hear a particular song, you have a nostalgic response because you remember where you were, you remember what you were doing in that moment, you remember what the music meant to you. Music is contextual, and it's the only thing that's like that in the world. There's nothing else that's going to give you that nostalgic feeling but music. And, and so I am one of those academics. I'm one of those humans. I'm one of those parents. I don't have any anxiety about where the music is going because I see time and time again that it's a cycle. We live in a cycle. There's going to, be, there's going to come a time when a chronics emerges when a Janine emerges, when, you know, 
Master Simon emerges when somebody from some other place emerges and they're at the pulse of what is the now. And we have to trust that, you know? Uh, quick point is, yes, reggae music and Messi's music, but um, I think my learned colleague had said eight different forms of music. So it's not just the message as in, you know, the pure reggae message, dance hall, shabarangs, you know, shaggy, Jean Paul. There is a different kind of music in terms of where the message is. Um, where I sit, I, I, I think I would like to see, and I speak, I'm not a producer, but I like music. I would give less production now and some better productions in, in some of the musics that been put out. I'd like to see some of the songs being crafted better, you know, to compete on a certain level. I think some of the music has become so simplistic. Some of it is no longer music. It's a nice collection of rhythms. I wish it was more music back into the music, you know, I, I, for me. So I think that we're losing some of that with not the music. So I wish for more music, really. Thank you. Do we, do we have time for one last question? Yes, okay, this yes, is our last yes. question. And then we have... Hello. Hello. If, if we have time. Yeah, we have, if the, we have, we have time. the question first, and then we have your song played, okay? Good, good, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Roshanak. I'm an artist. I'm here as a photographer for reggae.fr, and at the same time, I'm a writer, I'm a painter, and like I was telling myself, maybe I'm a philosopher as well. So I have, and I'm building my, I'm recycling myself and I'm building my artistic director role in, in life. And I've been, reggae music has been following me since I'm a youth. And as an artist, I've always been wondering how to win money, like the business, because the business is something so important in life. But at the same time, as artists, we need to say something. Like, all artists have something to say, whether we're musicians, we're painters, we're writers. And I think um, I'm, I was born in Iran and raised in France. And nothing in my cultural background would lead me to reggae music, if not because I'm a woman and a foreigner rising up here in Europe. And for me, before anything and before being business, reggae is a, like you said, is a, is a message and is a message of freedom and emancipation. So, of course, today we're not at a time where we are dreaming of black and white playing together in the schools, but we're still on the edge where there's uptown and downtown. I went to Jamaica twice and it happened that it was in reggae month, February, both times this year and last year. And I was so uh, amazed and somehow ashamed in myself that this music I cherish is become only a business. More than, uh, uh, I mean, business, uh, in French we say intrinsic, it means intrinsic. We, we cannot go without business, and this is what I'm learning today. But when business becomes the aim, it becomes a little bit strange, you know? And for me, reggae music, like you can make business with all kinds of music, but reggae music and business is like, you know, so somehow, sometimes I lose hope and lose my faith. And in Jamaica, I went to prison. It happened that chance brought me to a lot of different places. And I happened to find myself in Spanish town uh, prison where there was a reggae show. And this, opened my heart and my spirit and said, and I said to myself, okay, so there's still some artists, there's still some people that are bringing reggae music where I feel it's supposed to be. And this is my personal site. So I would like to thank you, all of you, because not all the time we see people who bluntly say what they feel, especially when they're sitting on the upside, up, uptown side of the place, you know? So thank you for that. And... Um, <laughs> And uh, <laughs> and I have another thing to say. So since I'm making a big market study since a, a while, and I looked for a market study specific, like you were saying, with numbers, market shares, 
um, uh, what is the percentage of dance hall, of this, of that, of roots, of new roots, whatever it is. And I never found any anywhere, either in Europe, either in France, in England. I wrote to some people in Jamaica, they never answered me, so I don't know if there is. So where do you think we could find a study like this? And if it hasn't been done, then why? Well, maybe somebody could do something and this study has uh, like, you know, they have rock, they have it in funk, they have it in hip hop, they have it in rap. So why don't we have it in reggae music? So, yeah, come it's in. very complicated. Why don't we have it in reggae music? Pat, Pat mentioned um, part of the reason though is that the, the metrics in relation to, to reggae dance hall is collected by Nielsen Sound, well, is accounted for only from Nielsen Sound Scan. So there are some other, there are some other um, things that we're not picking up. When the artist comes on the road and sells a, a CD, we're not, we're not picking up that kind of statistic. But more importantly, there are people in Jamaica, I said it earlier, who do not believe that this industry is really an industry to, worth paying attention to. So now there is, a, there is growing a critical mass of people who have taken an interest enough to do the kind of research that you're talking about. And you have my card, so write me. There's a study that was just done, published in March, on the status of the film and music industry in Jamaica, and it has some of the data you're looking for. I could just add, I know of a person in New York, he's from a Caribbean background, but lives in New York, who has developed um, technology where it's possible to trace, like you have a song released from Kingston, Jamaica, it's possible to trace where it goes in the world. It really is phenomenal. And um, it will probably be on the market by the end of the year, next year, depending how he wants to roll it out. But I really hope that can be a game changer for the industry because it will be able to say, look, in Spain, um, Dwayne Stevenson has, to call his name again, has you know, 10,000 fans over here, but in Italy he's got 30,000, and in Senegal he's got 100,000. Well, these are the places we need to market this artist to, or whoever it is. So I think it's quantifiable, and it's something, it's tangible. So it's something that can be presented, and hopefully it hits the market, and it can really show, in addition to some of the other things we've been mentioning, what the music is really doing out there besides these kind of dated uh, metrics that we have now and limited, limited metrics as well. Okay, thank you so much everybody for taking part in this session. Please give to our guests a warm round of applause. And since his name was mentioned quite often in this session, I want Dwayne Stevenson to get up at least and give him a warm welcome and a big round of applause because he is here and he was mentioned so Bring often. And please check out his work with this very exceptional. Yeah, thanks everybody for coming, for joining the Reggae University sessions. We hope you all to see you next year. And yeah, let's we start the conversations and let's yeah. keep them going, not only here, but also in Jamaica. Thanks a lot. And, and give a... Give a warm round of applause for our indefatigable assistant, Yulia, and our sound man, Hector. We'd also like to thank Sabrina Travant, our artistic director, and the entire Rototom Sunsplash scene. We'd like to see each and every one of you here next year. But right now, please give yourselves a warm round of applause for joining us here at the Reggae University this year. Go for it, go for it. A storybook. This is my storybook. I want to share it with the world. 
Don't judge it by the cover. Turn the page and have a look. This is my storybook. I want to share it with the world. Don't judge it by the cover. Turn the page and have a look. Well, I've been abused. Yes, I've been misused. I've been a victim of the system. I've been unkind to others. I lived my life in mysterious ways. But I gave love throughout all my days. But they tried to hold I back. They tried to stifle my sound. But they'll never, never hold I down. Cause with the power of Jah, I'm still around. I'll never give up. No, I'll never give up. Yes, I'm holding on. Because I know that Jah will make I wear my crown. This is my storybook. I want to share it with the world. Don't judge it by the cover. Turn the page and have a look. Whoa, oh, 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 oh. Yeah. Turn the page and have a look. Yeah. Storybook, you know. My name is Michael Mosiah. Yeah, man, just verse one, I tell you. Yeah, one verse. Thank you very much.